Listen to what the word of the Lord has to say from Acts chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Leaders and elders of our nation, are we being questioned because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly share this with you. And to all people of Israel, that he was healed in the name and the power of Jesus Christ from Nazareth. The man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in scripture where it says, the stone that your builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. This is the word of the Lord as we sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. You may be seated, church, as we direct our attention to the baptistry. 
Church family, I'd like for you to meet my good friend, Alec Rosamond. I'm joined by his dad, Tyler Rosamond, with me as well. And Alec is a kindergartner at First Pres Day School. Alec loves football and baseball, but most of all, he loves Jesus. And that's evident in his spirit and his words. And we're excited to see what Jesus is going to do in his life. But Alec, I now ask you, is it true that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Based upon that confession, I now baptize your name in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in a new way of life. <laughs> Next we have Camille Crawford. And coming on the heels of baby dedication, it's great to see parents continuing on that process of raising their children in Jesus Christ. And that's what they've done with Camille. And we're excited to see Camille, who's a first grader at Madison Station. And I'm joined by her father, uh, Tanny Crawford. And so if you know Camille, she also loves Jesus with all of her heart. Her precious spirit is something that you truly get to know. And so Camille, I now ask, is it true that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Based upon that confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new way of life.
Well, amen. Thank you so much for blessing our hearts through music. I want to invite you this morning on this Mother's Day to turn with me to the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 31, we'll be looking together beginning in verse 10. Verse 10 through 31, Proverbs chapter 31, a woman worthy of praise. As you're turning, it's a particular delight for me to have my mother and father here this morning who drove up from Mobile to be with us on this Mother's Day. She may be under the impression that I furnished the flowers in front of the pulpit this morning in her honor. That may or may not be accurate. Please do not tell her otherwise. Proverbs 31, a woman worthy of praise. We'll begin reading in verse 10, and it's fitting and writing good this morning on Mother's Day that we pause and reflect biblically on indeed a woman and a mother worthy of praise. The sermon this morning goes beyond mothers, but to all women, our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, our grandmothers, the women in our lives that we love. And the sermon really is aimed both to honor godly womanhood and also to us men to know what to pray for, what to cultivate, what to aspire unto. So this morning, as we read this passage, I want to invite all the women in the room to stand while I read this passage. All the women in the room, young or old, if you're a female, stand. If you're confused about that, I am not in a position to help you. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 31, begin reading with me in verse 10. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil, all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. Let's pray together. Father, we bow this morning with women in the room standing all around. And Father, this is Mother's Day, and we say a particular word of gratitude to the mothers in our lives, the mothers of our children. But Father, also this day we celebrate biblical womanhood in in all its splendor. Father, I pray this morning I'm mindful of ladies in the room who are yet to have a child or perhaps who cannot have a child, and this day brings very mixed emotions. Father, I pray today that they would see the virtue in womanhood in general and would see and perceive the nearness of you and the ministry of your spirit in their lives this day and every day. So, Father, we pray today to the men in the room that we would be the type of men who would cultivate such character, that would desire such a woman, that would seek to raise up such girls, and that we would be faithful as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, indeed, it is good this morning to honor women, the ladies, the widows, the daughters, the wives, the sisters, the mothers especially, and to reflect together on the virtuous woman, a woman worthy of praise. 
And indeed, we ought to honor the women in our lives because as the great saying goes, behind every great man is a shocked woman or something like that. But seriously, it is impossible to overrate the virtue, to overrate a woman worthy of honor. The great statesman Winston Churchill, who led his nation through the vortex of World War II and by many estimations is the most famous Englishman who ever lived, once was asked to state the great influences on his life, and a list was presented to him who had influenced him greatly, and he said, you have left off the greatest of all names, the greatest of all my teachers, my mother. Billy Graham, God's man for the 20th century, who preached in over 100 countries on six continents the gospel to more than 100 million people and was known as the greatest preacher on the planet. His children once reflected, not critical of him, but in a sweet spirit of testimony of their mother, said that our father is the greatest preacher on the planet, but our mother is the greatest preacher in the family. So we are reminded this morning of the influence, the power, the attractiveness of a virtuous, godly woman. And it is right on a day like this that we intentionally reframe our value system. We live in a world from Madison Avenue on the East Coast to Hollywood on the West that prevents to us relentless images and pictures and scenarios of what a woman is to be. And of course, so much of that estimation is on the physical, the attractive, the visual. The Bible does not denigrate the visual, it doesn't, but merely alongside of it, it raises up these other characteristics that are to displace the external and to replace it with the internal. So we see this morning Proverbs 31. See with me first this morning, the search for a virtuous woman. Verse 10, the author writes, an excellent wife who can find her worth is far above jewels. An excellent wife. This phrase refers to noble character, and your Bible translation might have it depicted just as that. An excellent wife, one with noble character, who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. So you see in all the wisdom of divine revelation, the the, the attribute that is placed front and center that is to be prized, that is to be searched for, that is to be valued above all else is internal beauty, virtue, in the heart. It doesn't say a, an unmatched beauty who can find, or a, a woman with a vast fortune who can find, or a woman with a perfect figure who can find. An excellent wife, a with noble character, who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The author here is making it plain that such a woman is not common. Such a woman has to be searched for. And to the men in the room today, especially the single men, I encourage you to be on the lookout for just such woman. One who brings worth with her, not necessarily a dowry of wealth, but a dowry of character. A a woman who by her heart you know that she will bring good into your life and not evil. A woman who by her inner disposition you know will be a blessing to children and to family and friends. A woman who in the inner person of her heart you can trust with your life and all that the Lord has given to you. I love the picture of of a search. And gentlemen, I'll say a word of encouragement to you and to those who obviously who are single. Be on the lookout for such a woman. Don't be passive. Don't be waiting. Don't expect such a one to stumble into your life, but be actively looking for the woman who God would have you to marry. I have a good friend in Kansas City who's on our board of trustees at the seminary. His name's Dr. Sandy Peterson, and just a phenomenal man. Well, many years ago, about 30 years ago, he was a part of one of these, these Caribbean treasure searches we've all heard of. 
a Spanish treasure ship that had went down several centuries ago, and he was a part of a team who invested money and brought together their expertise and kind of connected some dots historically, and then they had the, uh, the instrumentation and the technology to do a more, thor more thorough search, and over a period of months, and that led into a couple of years, he and this team actually found this sunken treasure ch ship that indeed was full of gold. He made a small fortune through his investment. But all the effort that went into that, the work that went into that, the, the intentionality that went into that to find this ship, that is the analogy we see here in verse 10. To be on the lookout, to pursue, to seek out and seek after, for her worth indeed is greater than a sunken treasure ship. I remember when Karen came into my life, I was a college student, and she was a college student, and our fathers worked together, and though they had worked together for decades, we had never met, and I met her in a, actually a country church revival. And so you need to go when the gospel's preached, you might find a wife along the way. But I was there, I met her, she was dating a guy who I quickly disposed of. <laughs> and in conversation, I found out that she was working the same place I was working that summer, and on my little lunch break, which was not very long, I hustled across the plant to go see her. I'd only had one brief conversation with her before. I walked into her office. There were three young men sitting there, crowded into her little office with her. She barely knew me. I did not know them. And I just looked at them straightway and said, I'm here to visit with Karen, so all of y'all are going to have to leave now. And Karen looked at me bug-eyed. Those three guys got up and left. And the rest, as they say, is history. That step of going and looking that I just colorfully spoke to, I got to tell you, I'm concerned about many young men in the 21st century who just seem to be coasting through life, not even pursuing the woman God would have for them. Gentlemen, pursue such a woman, and as you pursue, make sure you have your eyes set towards the right thing. Yes, one who is attractive to you externally, certainly that's appropriate, but one whose worth goes far deeper than the appearance. Now, notice with me quickly the signs of a virtuous woman, okay? So again, this is what we're praying for. This is what we're cultivating. This is what we are appreciating about our wives and our mothers. And we're just going to walk very quickly through these Proverbs and notice these different signs of a virtuous woman. And the author gives us, under, under divine inspiration, a three-dimensional view of what the virtuous woman looks like. Notice first, the virtuous woman, the virtuous wife, is supportive. Notice verses 11 and 12. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. This woman is a, is a bedrock of support, a foundation, a, a pillar of support. And the husband knows in his, in his heart of hearts that, that his woman believes in him. She's rooting for him. She's standing with him. Verse 11, this word trust means, means full confidence. As he's going about the business of the day and the responsibilities of life, he's not, he's not confused in the back of his mind about whether or not she is supporting him, whether or not she is standing with him, whether or not she is rooting for him. Verse 11 says, and, and such a man who has such a woman will have no lack of gain. This phrase in the ancient world referred to the plunders of war by the victors. And a, a conquering army defeats an enemy and the plunders of war is theirs. The gold, the silver, the livestock, and anything else that they may have is theirs. The picture here is of, of such a man who has such a supportive woman, a supportive wife in his life. Together they go through life, and it's as though they are plundering the best this world has to offer. Verse 12, she's so supportive. In fact, she does good, not evil. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. I, I, I love this. In other words, behind his back, she doesn't ridicule him. She doesn't belittle him. Uh, she doesn't speak ill of him. And, and obviously, this principle goes both ways. Such is her support. Notice verse 23, that her husband's reputation in the gates. Think of that phrase as like in the city square. Throughout the town, her husband's reputation 
He is known in the gates positively when he sits among the elders of the land. A virtuous woman is like that. Let me say a word of encouragement here. Sometimes in churches, there are small groups or discipleship groups or prayer groups, which obviously are appropriate and good and healthy in most every way. But sometimes if we're not careful, whether it's a men's group meeting with men or a woman's group that's meeting with women, if we're not careful, those can become kind of complaint sessions where the men find themselves complaining about what's lacking in their wife or vice versa, where the women find themselves complaining about what's lacking in their husbands. That is unhealthy and that is not of the Lord. If there is a particular problem that is pronounced and persistent, then yes, seek out your pastor, seek counseling in some way to help and strengthen the relationship, but don't fall prey to a rhythm of life where you get together with your friends and you find yourself talking down your spouse. If you do that, don't be surprised if your spouse lives down to your low assessment. She's supportive. Notice secondly, she's, she's sacrificial. Notice verse 13. She, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. Wool and flax were, were sewing materials. And again, obviously this is the ancient world. The point is not that to be a good biblical wife, you have to be able to sew. But the point is that, that the, the virtuous woman, there's a, a diligence about her life. There's a sense of, of sacrifice for her children and her family about her life. There's an intentionality to what she does, and she gives herself in such a way to the sacrificial benefit of her family. Notice verse 14. So much so, even with money, she is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. The idea is of, is of going out and stewarding the money well and, and fighting that deal, coming home and saying, dear, you'll never guess how much I saved you today. Anybody heard that line? Not as much if you stay home, but hey, take what we can get. But my wife, when we had five young children pastoring a small church and seeing her week in and week out be intentional and know where the sales were, know where the coupons were, buying groceries at Aldi in bulk quantity. One year we were vacationing at Orange Beach, and at that year we had three children in diapers. One of those children was productive enough that he required double diapers. And so that meant we were, in essence, buying diapers for four children at the same time. And Karen had found some kind of crazy deal online, and you, you, this was a deal only in Orange Beach. And so we literally drove from Orange Beach to Louisville, Kentucky, 650 miles, with like a thousand diapers crammed in our van to last us for the months to follow because a deal was found. This is the idea we get here, that the sacrificial sense of, of looking and, and seeing and seeking to the benefit of the family. Verse 15, she's so sacrificial, she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maiden. There is a, a maternalistic instinct God has given women that is sweet to observe and that is a blessing to the family. I'm the light sleeper in our house. My wife is the heavy sleeper. I've seen her sleep through her cell phone ringing by her head. She sets an alarm. I don't know why. She never wakes up to it. She doesn't hear it. I wake her up when her alarm goes off. But when we had children, funny thing, I would sleep through the baby crying. She, on the slightest whimper, every time would be alerted. Folks, you can't teach that stuff. God places that instinct in the heart of the mother. So the virtuous woman is supportive. Secondly, she's sacrificial. Notice thirdly, she's shrewd. I love this. She's shrewd. Notice verse 16. She girds herself with strength. She makes her arm strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her, her lamp does not go out at night. She, she, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. And then verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. So interesting here, the virtuous woman clearly is engaged in some degree of commercial activity. Again, we're, we're, we're zooming back from the ancient world to the contemporary world. The principle, I don't believe that, you know, if you're, if you're wife or mother, you're not involved in some, some public sector business activity, that uh, you're not being as strong and as giving as you could be. But the idea here is her instincts. Again, there's this shrewd way about having an eye out for and an ear open for opportunities, scenarios, bargains that can be a blessing to 
the family. We had a birthday party yesterday at Main Event, which is one of these all-encompassing places. They got bowling, they got laser tag, they got arcade, they provide food, they host birthday parties, and we have three different sermon, uh, we have three different summer birthdays that happen, and all three of those occur when school is out, so our kids can't really have a party with their kids. They're out of school, and, and so we, Karen, we, over the years, we sometimes lump those together, and so we had three birthday parties and one yesterday morning at Main Event, and, and I was just like, I don't even want to know how much this is going to cost me. And uh, we were kind of comparing notes yesterday afternoon, and, and my wife, my goodness, she had went online and filled out this survey that, you know, I, I can just never have the patience to do. She filled out this online survey that knocked $50 off. She took us in the morning hour that knocked off money, and before you knew it, main event was nearly paying us to have this event in their place. That, that's a blessing to the family because that frees up more money for other things, and such is this virtu virtuous woman. There's a shrewdness there. Notice fourth, the word serving. Notice 19. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. Again, this is the ancient world where obviously sewing and cloth making would often take place, most often take place in the context of one's own family. Verse 20, she extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household because all her ch children are clothed with scarlet. Now, men, let me say a word to you. Many women in our lives, our mothers and our, and our wives and our daughters, are, they are sort of pre-inclined to be servant-minded. I want to challenge you not to take advantage of that. Never take advantage of that. I highlight this passage here because it is spelled out so plainly and a reminder of what we are to appreciate in the women God has in our lives. It's not biblical male leadership to expect yourself to be served relentlessly by the women in your life. At the same time, here we see this, this, this commendation, this word of commendation because of the service that she's rendering. She, she's diligent, verse 19, verse 20. So much so there's an abundance. There's an abundance there that, that, that can be distributed to other people to help others. And then verse 21, there's a, a preparation. The virtuous woman is not afraid when winter hits because she doesn't have a coat lined up for the kids, you see. She's always looking to the future, always looking forward, always anticipating family and personal needs. Even as I, these words come across my lips and fall in your ears, gentlemen, be grateful for the women God has in your life and that lives their lives in such a way. Now, notice fifthly, the virtue here is securing. Notice verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and she smile, and, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. You see, God seems to give women, especially mothers, a, a sixth sense about them, able to bring, to, to foster stability and security. The security plays itself out in verse 25 again. They are not fearful of the storms of life because of the godliness and strength of this woman. Verse 26, the word of God is in her heart and comes out in her mouth. She opens her mouth and speaks words of will, wisdom. There, there's a, a soothing nature to her conversation. And she's preparing even for all eventualities. Verse 27, she does not... She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Last year, I was talking to a couple that were having marital trouble, a, a couple not in Jackson, obviously, and uh, was visiting with them about what was going on. And, and, and the husband said, I, I, my wife does nothing but lives on Facebook. He said, I, I, I'm married to Facebook. And she just scrolls Facebook all the time, looks at Facebook all the time. And it's Facebook, 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 Facebook. And I thought of this verse in contrast to that comment. There are so many different opportunities for distraction for men and women, husbands and fathers, mothers and wives. 
so many opportunities. And for all of us, we have to guard our heart as far as how much time we allocate to entertainment. We allocate to social media. We allocate to opportunities and events that present themselves. The virtuous woman knows how to keep certain things at bay, to keep focus on that which is most important, the family God has entrusted to her. Well, notice with me finally, verse 28 through 31, the song of a virtuous woman. How poetically the book of Proverbs comes to an end here in this passage rolls up these words of praise for such a mother. Verse 28, this song is, 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 is projected about her. Her children rise up and bless her. Ladies in the room today, what greater goal could you have in life than for those who know you best to honor you the most? At the end of the day, when our lives are winding down, our legacies are becoming clear as to what God did to our children, our grandchildren, and our, our family, our husbands, and the, our other spheres of influence, what a great epitaph if this can be written by your children rising up and speaking words of blessing, but not just your children, your husband as well. So here's the song. Notice verse 29. Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Men, there ought to be a sense in your heart that you know objectively in the abstract that your wife isn't perfect, but in your heart it feels as though she's perfect for you. This is the word of praise. Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Verse 30 Charm is deceitful, meaning it, it can kind of be turned on and turned off. It can kind of be turned on and turned off. It can be turned on when on the front end of a relationship, when one is trying to endear oneself to another. It comes and goes. And beauty, well, that is vain. What does it mean to be in vain? It means it's shallow. It doesn't mean it's evil, but it does mean that it's passing. And to ultimately pursue one's spouse based upon the, the sweet word spoken through charm, or the visual appearance to the eye, frankly, it's a fool's wager because you will marry the charm and marry the beauty, but you will live with the inner person within. That's why the word but is here in verse 30. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. Now, this is the song that will be sung to the virtuous woman. Man, I want you to lean in here. I wish I could grab each one of you by the lapels and pull you close. Verses 29 through 31 ought to be framing verses for our lives for our marriages, and for our families. On the one hand, or, or firstly, to have your value system in order. To honor and to cultivate and to steward the hearts of our wives in such a way that brings out the very best in her. And to not be afraid or unwilling or reluctant to praise her in the gates, in the city. Let people know how you feel about her. Be careful bragging on her. Selfishly, it just makes you look better. If you married a great woman, people are going to think, well, wow, what an accomplishment. He married over his head. But more deeply and more biblically, it is right to give honor to whom honor is due. And if your spouse, your mother, has lived a life of virtue, my goodness, let our lips not be silent for silence is deafening. But let our lips be emblematic of what we see here, rising and speaking words of affirmation and love and appreciation. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. It has now been nearly 
20 years since I proposed to my wife. We've been married 19 years this June, and so nearly 20 years since I proposed to her. And I took my father's boat out in Mobile Bay, and the two of us were there, and I opened my Bible to Proverbs 31, and I read these verses to her. And I told Karen, I'm asking you to marry me because I see in you not only the external beauty God has graced you with, but the inner heart that reflects these things. And my pledge to you is to do my best to cultivate these things in you and to be the man who will indeed praise you in the gates and who indeed will honor you as no doubt honor will be due. So men, I say to you, live closely to Proverbs 31. Look at it, read it, speak it, and seek to honor the women in your life who have lived lives that resemble Proverbs 31. Would you pray with me? Father, we bow now. And we thank you for this great passage. And Father, I pray this morning for the women in the room today. Father, there are women in the room today who've come here and they limped into church because they see children around them and it reminds them of the children they don't have. And Father, I pray that this Lord's Day, this text, this service, that there would be a, a sweet reminder in their hearts of the special care and love you have for them. Father, I pray for the women in the room corporately, the, the wives, the mothers, the sisters, the daughters, the grandmothers. I pray, Father, that they would see Proverbs 31 as a great aspiration to long for and strive for by your grace and perfectly, yes, but steadfastly the same. And Father, I pray for the men in the room that we would, A, be discerning single men and have hearts that are rightly aligned as we look for a spouse understanding these prophetic words in Proverbs 31 about what matters in the long run. I pray, Father, that we would appreciate and honor and serve our wives this day, but every day, as women who are virtuous and worthy of such honor. So, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of response, and what a great day to join the church. What a great day to give your life to Christ. Ladies, you can never be the woman, the mother you would desire to be unless Jesus is Lord of your life. Husbands, you'll never be able to honor your, your wife as God would have you to unless Jesus is Lord of your life. Perhaps you would like to join this church or pursue church or pursue baptism. Today, this invitation is for you. So let's stand together, sing to the Lord. If God has touched your heart today or some other spiritual decision, come now as we sing. Let's sing together with full voice. has the power to raise the dead and who can save us from our sin he is our hope our righteousness Jesus only Jesus and who can make the blind to see who holds the keys that set us free? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus, hold me, Jesus. Oh, King Almighty, Lord, save. Stand alone, and I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King Almighty, Lord, sing, sing.
loves me. What a wonderful reminder as we are here today on this great Lord's Day and Mother's Day. So to the women in the room, thank you for being a mother. Whether you have bore a child or whether you have stood beside someone who needed you at that very moment. I have the privilege of having Charlotte Walker as my mother and she has stood by my side for 44 years. I am grateful for her. I have three church moms who stand by my side each week. Miss Eva Hart takes care of me. <laughs> Miss Terry Sims and Miss Syl Litchfield. All are wonderful moms to me. I call them my church moms. They make sure I do exactly what I'm supposed to every week. And I'm very grateful. Uh, we have many families over here today that are going to dedicate some children. And so, Miss Marley, would you introduce these families and children to us? We have nine families coming today, publicly committing to raise their children to love and follow Jesus. First, Cody Carroll Bailey Jr. is being dedicated by his mom and dad, Cody and Jenna, and he is joined by his big sisters, Virginia and Genevieve. Next, Hudson Thomas Cockrell is being dedicated by his parents, Chad and Mitzi. Zoe Jules Fant is being dedicated by her father and mother, Justin and Jennifer. Emery Rachel Green is being dedicated by dad and mom, Edward and Emily. Emma Catherine Gregory is being dedicated by her parents, Samuel and Haley. Sean Christopher Holbrook is being dedicated by his mom and dad, Brandon and Stephanie, and is joined by his siblings, Victoria, Audrey, Garrett, and Carter. Graham Thomas Nichols is being dedicated by his parents, David and Tressie. Marin James Nichols is being dedicated by her father and mother, Trey and Katie, and is accompanied by her big sister, Dawson. Dante Tiberius Pateri and Raven Yui Hall are being dedicated by their foster mom, Catherine Wartman, with the assistance of her daughter, Wendy Wartman. Church family, I'd like for y'all to meet the graduating class of 2036. So, <clears throat> families, we're so excited to partner with you today in dedicating your child. Uh, we're truly blessed as a church family, uh, and we're looking forward to the journey, uh, the spiritual and discipleship journey that is ahead for your children. And so going along with that, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, uh, we think about Moses. And Moses commanded that day, uh, he talked to grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and anyone that would listen. And he said, the most important thing that you can do is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he said that to parents, and we say that to you today. And so in dedicating your child, I have four statements for you to confirm uh, by saying we do. The first one is this. Do you acknowledge that your child is a gift and a trust from God and that you're responsible to God for his and her, her Christian nurture? Will you pray for your child's salvation and teach your child that the way of salvation is through the faith of Jesus Christ? Since your child will learn in both word and example, you set a godly example in prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, giving, and serving through the church. Do you at this present time present your child before God, saying that whatever God may want your child to do or to be, you're willing to release him or her to his perfect plan? Amen. 
So out before you is not only your family, but also your church family. It's a church family that loves you very much and more than you realize it maybe even this very moment. But they're going to be praying for you. Uh, they're going to be teaching your children in vacation Bible school, RAs, GAs, children's choir, and all kinds of activities. And so church family, have a challenge for you today as well in, in this dedication ceremony. If you're willing to pray for these children, if you're willing to pray for their parents and love and adore them as they love and adore their own, I'd like to ask that you stand to this time and join me in a word of prayer for these families. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you for uh, the gift uh, of these children that stand before us today, Lord. We thank you for the responsibility to be able to partner with them and their parents, Lord, and raising them in your way, Jesus. Lord, we pray for your scripture, for it to be planted in their hearts today. And Lord, uh, may uh, this process and this journey of discipleship begin at this very moment, Lord, and uh, as they continue to grow and share about your love for each and every single one of them, Father. We ask uh, for your wisdom and discernment for them as parents, Lord. Lord, as they seek your will each and every single day in raising their children, God. In your holy name we pray. 